Bob Peterson, Earl Spence, give us a quick breakdown. Uh, well, you know, I think a lot of our strengths fall into each other. They, I think each man falls into each other's strengths. And they're both great body punchers. I think they're both guys who come forward um, and, uh, you know, they like to... Uh, like to go to the body and try to break you down physically and mentally. So it'll be interesting because both guys like to do the same things. But uh, but uh, I, I think Errol is probably the naturally bigger guy, you know, so he probably has the advantage as well as being younger and fresher. Now we're talking about 147. Man, I'll call you right back. I'll call you right back. We need three minutes. All right, all right, all right. Do you think fighters avoid fighters? You've been, a, you've been in this fight game for over 30 plus years. I don't think they avoid them. I think they just try to marinate certain fights. For example, Errol Spence is very dangerous right now, but he's not the big name yet, you know? Getting beat by Errol Spence in three years probably makes you more money than getting beat by Errol Spence today. You know, so so I think um, if, if you're going to risk a fight against Errol Spence, you probably want to maximize it and monetize it as much as possible. So I think uh, fighters, uh, uh, because this is a business, uh, they try to make business decisions. And, uh, and, and the thing when you don't see fights happening right away is because when you're trying to maximize the risk, uh, monetarily maximize the risk you're going to take against a certain fighter. Who's the best at it's between Errol and Keith, you know, it's between Errol and Keith. It's a, uh, and that's my favorite fight on, on uh, in the welterweight division, if we see it, I think it's a lot for, it is for a lot of people, but, uh, you know, it, it, we'll see, we'll see how they, they, that things develop, we'll see how Keith comes back from the injury as well. Do you think we'll see that fight this year? I, I don't know if we'll see it this year, I, I, I'm, I, if I'm really, you think with my mind, I probably, I, I would probably think it gets delayed to 2019, we'll see. Does it feel like we're starting to get out from under the shadow of Floyd May, the Floyd Mayweather era? You know, every era has that, you know? You had the uh, Ali era, then you had the Ray Leonard era, then you had the Mike Tyson era, then you had the De La Hoy era. You know, there's kind of that passing, and sometimes in between uh, eras, you kind of have that vacuum that needs to be filled, you know? And, um, you know, Floyd legitimately retired a couple of years ago, now, you know? So, you know, the McGregor fight aside, you know, he hadn't been in a, in a, uh, uh, a ranking type of fight, a fight that meant something for the rankings, it meant something for the title in a couple of years, you know, so you had that vacuum there, you know, I think Floyd coming back against McGregor, if anything, maybe added to the vacuum because it prevented somebody else from being able to step in in those couple of years and, and really taking over the, the mantle, but I think now, I think with Floyd probably gone for good, I think you have, you're going to have a chance for somebody to legitimately fill the vacuum, we'll see, because there's always, but until there's the rumors of Floyd, is he coming back, is he not coming back, you know, you never, people never, people never take any, any, any the next era seriously, you know, because it's like, oh, Floyd comes back, it's Floyd, you know, so, but I think at this point, um, you know, you can never predict what Floyd Mayweather's going to do, but I, I, I think he's going to retire for good, you know, I, I, and I think finally somebody else is going to get the chance to kind of step in, and we'll see who that guy is, because, you know, it's not just about the skill-wise, skill set, and and, 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 uh, and being the best, it's also about popularity, marketability, you know, being a... Being that a fighter of that of that with that aura now that level, it is a lot of things involved. Do you think he'll be able to retire? Though I mean, I know a lot of times when guys retire, they got to find something else to do. I mean, with yeah. you, you've got commentary. Well, here's the thing. You know, with Floyd, there's a legacy to protect. You know, he's quite possibly the best that ever did it. So, so you know, I, I think with so many people trying to take that away from him as is, you know, the, the older you are when you come back, the the more you're putting that at risk, you know, so I think as far as legacy is concerned, you know, you you take that 50 and 0, you, you take it, you cash it at the bank, and uh, and you see, you see it, it gives you back greatness, you know, and I don't think you mess with that, you know, but we'll see, Floyd, Floyd's his own man and he does what he does. What if the right opportunity comes up, though? I mean, like, even with you, I know you have to calculate I know you're retired, the risk, You have but... to calculate the risk, though, you know? See, for me, it's, it's less about legacy because, really, you know, what are people really going to say about Paulie Malinaj? Yeah, he won two world titles. He was a pretty good fighter. So, is an extra win or loss going to make a difference in my legacy? Not really. So, you know, for me, if the right opportunity comes, of course. But for Floyd, he's made so much money anyway that monetarily, is, is, is anything worth the, the risking the legacy? Because as you're older, you're always putting yourself more at risk. So, we'll see. So, you mentioned post-career. Are you still affiliated with Saddam Ali? Um, you know, I watched Saddam grow up. You know, um, I, I'm not per se and the team but you know we still talked uh, I talked to him after his last fight I was real happy to see him win you know he's a kid that I know since he's, he's about nine years old when I met him you know so so you know it was it was really uh, fun to see him uh, win that championship and talk to him afterwards and whatnot and I hope he's, he continues to you know continues to achieve all his dreams and make the title defenses he wants and make the money he wants because I know how badly this kid wanted it. I, you know I've heard this kid talk since he's a kid about how badly he wanted to achieve this dream and to finally see him do it especially after the initial disappointment with Vargas 
you know, uh, and to, to, to achieve it against a future Hall of Famer in Cotto, to achieve it on a fight of that magnitude, I really was happy for him. And I knew he could always come through at that level. It was just a matter of him having the right night and putting it all together on the right night. Do you think Charlo should be his next fight, or do you think he should? I think Saddam Ali is a welterweight in, in, with a GM middleweight world title. You know, so I think he can go back down to welterweight, but once you've won the world title, why should you vacate it? So I think if you're Saddam Ali, you probably take on your mandatory. It's William Smith, I think, right? Is a WBO mandatory. Handle your, your mandatory. Not that it's easy, but I think Saddam has a skill set that may possibly handle William Smith. And then you probably take on ex welterweights just like you are. You know, you don't need to, to go crazy. You can make take on ex welterweights like, like, like a Kell Brook. Like a Kell Brook. I was just going to mention that. Take the words out of my mouth. Like a Kell Brook, something like where you can, you're still making fun fights, fights people want to watch, fights people will watch. Watch and see, and they'll still legitimize you, legacy-wise as well as financially. So yeah. I, I think I think you have to act accordingly in that way. You fought Amir Khan, you fought Adrian Broner. If they fight, how do you see that fight on Oh, um, you know, I, I, I like both guys. I respect both guys. Stylistically, it's a bad fight for Adrian Broner. Uh, that, that's a bad fight for Adrian Broner. You know, uh, Amir Khan is very fast. Broner is kind of slow on his feet, and Amir changes range a lot. Um, Adrian a lot of times seems like he's stuck in the mud when he's dealing with speed coming back at him. Um, he kind of locks up. Um, he's still a good fighter. I think you got to pick the right fights for Adrian. I think the Omar Figueroa fight is going to be a real fun fight. Stylistically, you know, I think you know the fight that they're talking about right now with Adrian and Figueroa. And I think that can be a real fun fight. A clash of styles, shots being thrown, fired, landed. A lot of could be a lot of time in the pocket. But Paul, you the kind of fights Adrian think... should be in. I think Adrian should have took a step back and kind of rebuilt. Me personally, you know, that's what I told him after the fight. You know, but uh, I understand he yearns to be in big fights. That's your ego. Believe me, we all want to do that. I can't fault them for actually taking the fight. I mean, if it comes your way, you're going to take it, right? So, so at, at, at day's end, do I think he had time to take a, take a step back like I did after the Amir Khan fight and then kind of come around uh, for another a wave of momentum and try to win another world title? Yeah, I, I felt he could have done that. Uh, but instead, he puts himself at risk. You gotta, you know, Adrian has been in a lot of big fights, been in a lot of tough, with a lot of tough opponents. You know, so you can't really say you gotta be surprised at this. But uh, yeah, he's credit to him for taking the risk because Figueroa is not playing around right now. I mean, I, that knockout he had of Guerrero was really a statement. That's what I was gonna say. You don't think you don't think Omar Figueroa could potentially be a bad style for? Because when you fought him, yeah, you good. said all you gotta do to beat Adrian is be, be busy. Yeah, be busy. You know, uh, and Omar is busy with a lot of weird punches too. Uh, you guys in the pocket, and he hurts you. He hurts you. I don't think Omar does is hurt you. Um, Omar's got to be careful though in the pocket with some. Sometimes the shots get too wide and a little, there's a little bit too much daylight in between them. Then you're actually giving Adrian some light to shoot in between your shots. Adrian locks up when the speed is too much. You know what I mean? He'll lock up. But if you're giving him daylight, and sometimes Omar does give you daylight, he might do you like he did in the Marco. You stayed in the pocket, try to throw punches, but there's enough daylight in there where Adrian's punching in between and making you pay for them. So these are the the variables in the fight and that's why it's good you know you could one this you could see this happening but you could also see this happening which one is going to happen you know so yeah. hey, it's a good fight you're one of the biggest advocates for cleaning the sport of boxing you've been like that from day one mm -hmm. Kevin Farmer's opponent on his first test was found dirty the guy yeah, yeah, the, the guy, Japanese guy. Yeah, just came out yesterday. <laughs> yeah. so they're, yeah. waiting, they're waiting yeah. for the beat. Yeah. Yeah. Can I say that? <laughs> <laughs> now, if the beat sample is positive too, then he's for sure 100%. Wow, true. that's crazy. Wow, and even Kevin over there, man, it's crazy. How's this still happening? Oh man, oh that's crazy. It's crazy. I gotta be honest. I thought the fight could have went either way. You know what I mean? Like I didn't think it was as much of a robbery as people thought. I thought it was a good fight. I thought it, I wanted to see a rematch, but man. I mean, this guy, what did he fail for? Testosterone? Testosterone? Like wow. Wow, it's crazy. That's <laughs> crazy. expert. You That's mentioned crazy. two key words about Adrian Broner. He locks up and speed comes at him. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't like the American fight. Do, do you think his best days are behind him, Adrian Broner? Um, no, no. I, I, I think if mentally he can get himself going and, and kind of understand the game plan going forward as far as not just one this fight as far as for his career you have to have a game plan for your career okay I want to do this I'm gonna get there taking this route or I'm, I want to do this I'm gonna get there taking this route not I'm gonna take this fight I'm gonna take this fight whatever comes my way you have to have, you have to have playing your courts you know, and you have to, yeah, you have to navigate it. and I think Adrian is old enough to where he, he gotta understand that it's time to navigate the, the situation accordingly you know what I'm saying you don't just take any big fight that comes your way and see what goes on you know what I'm saying you think he understands that though I don't know I don't know you know he's you don't 28, have five, what is he, 28 years old at this point you know he's he should understand that at 28 years old I understood it, you, you know? have five or six private conversations well, at least that I've seen yeah 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 know? of course you know and, I mean, um, hey, listen I don't think AB's a stupid guy I, I think sometimes he lets his, lets his uh 
he, he thinks out loud instead of thinking in his mind. And sometimes, sometimes I do that too, so I don't, you know, I, I can't, I can't fault him for it. But um, sometimes, uh, you know, he lets his emotions get the best of him. So I think I do as well. But um, you know, he, 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 he succumbs to the peer pressure sometimes a little too much, and I think he's got to be a little bit more mature about that. And hopefully, we'll see that. You know. I like Omar Figueroa too. You know, we're talking about you know Adrian Broner. I, I like Omar too, man. I, I like Omar a lot. You know, he's been a fun guy to watch all the time. He's got his own story with his injuries and whatnot, blown layoffs and whatnot. These are two fights, two fighters that really need this. They really need this win. And uh, it's gonna be fun to watch the fight, but it's gonna be sad to see some one of them lose because they both entertain us a lot. Yeah. Talk to me about Amir Khan real quick. He just recently signed with Eddie Hearn, Matchroom Boxing. Obviously, he's an Al Heyman fighter. You're an Al Heyman fighter. I was actually kind of shocked when I heard the news because typically. Al Heyman fighters don't sign with promoters, but yeah. this makes like the second yeah, one Danny Jacobs, following Danny yeah. Jacobs. Yeah, you know, uh, I think Eddie Hearn is really making a play. Uh, first, I thought he was the, probably the biggest promoter in Europe. He's making a play to become the biggest promoter in the world. You know, uh, Matchroom is really uh, uh, in, a, in a really powerful position right now. They're, the jewel is uh, Anthony Joshua, but they've got a lot of championship world fighters involved in there as well. Uh, signing Amir Khan, um, some a guy that they've probably had a little bit of beef with through the years because they're trying to make the Brook fight and they haven't been able to. I think that was a big power move as well, you know? Because uh, I think Amir, say what you will about him and criticize what you will about him, he's still a star, you know? And anytime he fights, he's going to generate asses and seats, especially in the UK. He hasn't fought in the UK in a while, man. Five years. I mean, uh, Eddie is going to bring this guy back to the UK and, and maximize that marketability he has over there. Maybe bring him back or maybe not. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Eddie Hearn has Matchroom USA and he has Matchroom in the UK. You know what I mean? So, so you know, you have his power on both levels, sides of the Atlantic. I think it was a good move for Amir. Um, and I think, uh, I, I think you know, there's some potentially, there's some potentially fun things out there uh, that for Eddie and Amir. Coming off of a two-year layoff, what type of a fight should he be looking at? Well, you know, uh, a guy your friend that, Phil LaGreco yeah, was... Well, I, I think Phil's a good opponent for him, you know? Uh, yeah, I you gotta be looking at a guy, you don't wanna be jumping right back into the mix with a top guy, you know? You gotta be looking at a, a Phil Greco type of opponent who's who's been in there with top guys, who's come up short, but he's been in there with top guys and, and he's performed well and you know he's he's always given a good account of himself, you know. Those are the kind of guys you kinda of wanna uh, fight if you're a Khan, you know, uh, where Phil never puts on a bad show. But he's come up short, so you figure if Amir is Amir, he's supposed to win the fight, right? But at the same time, if he's not Amir, Phil is good enough to beat him, right? So it's it's, it's a situation where you know you'd like to see that kind of a fight, that kind of opponent, and of course because Phil's my boy, I like to see him get the fight as well. Looks like that's the direction they're headed in. To, yeah. is, is the Kell Brook fight actually? Yeah, well that's that's the long-term goal, right? right. Again, and we just talk about you navigating the system over here, you know, and you know you're gonna take this fight with the with the long-term eye on possibly a Kell Brook fight. We'll see, because like I said, Kell Brook I'm sure is also looking at Saddam Ali. Is that a fight that takes place at 154, 147, catch weight? Yeah, you can't you gotta stop with the bullshit weights now, man. I mean, Amir went up to 155 to fight Canelo. He can go up to 154 to fight Brooke. I mean, come on, bro. Should Amir go up or should Cal go down? Cal can't make weight. Come on, man. We saw what he went through already. You know what I mean? Come on. You know, like, if you wanna, listen. Listen, I'll be honest with you. I mean, Amir's a good fighter. He killed a good fighter. Amir obviously beat me. I respect them both. But if we're gonna call a spade a spade, Amir has not wanted to fight Kelvin. Amir has not wanted to fight Kelvin. I mean, he's figured out every way out of that fight. You know what I mean? It's, it's, a, it's a domestic super clash. And he figured out a way out of it every time to the point where now it's not even as relevant anymore. It was once one of the most relevant welterweight fights in the world. Now it's probably still the most relevant fight in England, aside from Joshua Fury, but it's not a, a major welterweight fight worldwide anymore. You know what I'm saying? People still watch him tune in because they're big names, but it is lost his luster. You know, he looked, he waited to the point where he made the fight lose his luster, you know? So so at this point, and we're gonna have another Calzaghi Frotch, uh, Hatton Witter, or are we gonna have Ben Eubank, you know what I'm saying? Where they're gonna get in and do it. You know what I mean? I wanna see that. Okay, Speaking so. of Joshua, this is my last question. Well, maybe not, but <laughs> <laughs> heavyweight division, Anthony Joshua fighting Joseph Parker, big fight coming up. How do you see that fight playing out? You know, it's hard to pick against Joshua, but you know what else I like about Joshua? He's not taking on the soft cupcakes, man. You know, this, this guy went from Klitschko in a rough fight. He's gonna fight Pulev. Pulev is no cupcake. Pulev was gonna be a tough fight. Pulev had to pull out. He ended up with the calm. It was it was more than he bargained for as a, as a backup. And now, you know, the unification against Joseph Parker was not playing around. You know, this is the first heavyweight unification fight where both fighters are undefeated. And, I don't know, was it Tyson Spinks maybe? I don't know, you know what I'm saying? Like, Tyson Spinks was the first boxing memory I had. So if it's that long, I mean, it's literally my whole life almost. You know what I'm saying? So, so this. This is, you know, credit to Joshua for believing in himself and going after these guys. Because at the end of the day, Parker is the WBO heavyweight champion. And he might want a fight like the Joshua fight or whatnot. But he's not getting it unless Joshua agrees. You know, I mean, Joshua 
holds all the cards here in the world, in the heavyweight division, I believe. And uh, what he says is going to happen. You know what I mean? So if he has to, he, so credit to him for agreeing, constantly agreeing to these tough fights because a guy in his position doesn't always do that. Because like I said, sometimes you try to ma maximize and monetize them correctly by maximizing the, the waiting period. This guy's just going after one after another. He's trying, he's trying to knock them over like bowling pins, bro. You know what are you so, talking about going after them? How about you know, when we won't? <laughs> well, the Wilder Wild fight coming out after that, but I'll tell you what, that's where you kind of got to wait a little bit because Wilder, to me, poses the biggest threat. Not that Parker doesn't pose a threat. I don't want to disrespect Parker. He deserves the credit he's getting over here. But I believe you got to make the Fury fight first with Joshua. Why is that? Because you got to make the Fury fight first because it's a domestic level super bomb Blockbuster. fight type of thing. Blockbuster fight to where both guys are undefeated and it's for a piece of the heavyweight championship of the world uh, on, a, on a domestic level on, on a domestic yeah. level you know what I mean a domestic English level, but it's so it has worldwide implications but but national humongous implications Implode. see if you put if you put Joshua Wilder first Joshua could lose that fight I mean he can win it but it's a big risk you lose it too now that you lose the fight what are you gonna make Joshua Fury for no heavyweight title I mean then then Joshua Fury becomes for no heavyweight title you know what I mean it's still a great fight but there's no heavyweight title on the line you know so because now yeah they hold all the cards, you know. So, so I, if I'm thinking the way the business is probably the business guys are thinking who are involved in this, I'm thinking they're going to try to make Joshua Fury before they make Joshua Wilder. So we'll, but we'll see. We'll With see that same play. logic, though, I would think, okay, let's say they make Joshua Fury. Joshua wins that fight, then they could make Joshua David Hay Bellew winner. They could, they could do that. Yeah, fight but well. that, that, they're not a, with as much luster. I mean, Fury beat Klitschko, bro. Fury beat Klitschko when there was ten years that Klitschko had lost. You know what I mean? Still can't forget that. That one win alone, you know what I mean? Right there, is is it, it, it brings a lot of value to it. You know, Bellew and Hay. You know, they're up and down. Bellew's, Bellew's, you know, he's had, got a great career, but he's not a legitimate heavyweight. You know, people aren't gonna look at it as much with as much risk factor. You know what I'm saying? Like. Fear the Fury fight, this guy's about 6'9, 6'10. You know, Fear the Fury fight, this guy is, you know, coming off this weird layoff where he's been all over the place. But <laughs> so people are wondering, like, is he gonna be as good as he was? If he's as good as he was, he's a legitimate player here, you know? Right. But people, well, curiosity is what does Fury have left? You know, so I'd like to see Fury with one fight before he fights Joshua. I'd like to see that. Because like, if you're throwing a man after two years off, uh, against Joshua, you, you probably throw him into to the slaughter, you know. But you get him in one fight and see how, where he's at, and hopefully it looks good. Then you can maximize it. But then again, you also risk getting him beat if, if he's not ready at all, you know. If you take one warm up fight, you know, you, you, you're risking the, the Tyson Buster Douglas effect, you know. I don't know. I don't know what the play is here. I'm not. I'm not in the position to. I want to have that problem because whoever's got that problem is making a lot of money. Yeah. You know? but, but 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 you know, we'll see. We'll see how that plays out. I, I think the play is the uh, Joshua Fury, and then uh, and then. Uh, if Joshua can come through it, Joshua uh, Wilder. But let's not sleep on Parker because if Parker wins here, he's an undefeated unified heavyweight champion, and then everything switches around. I actually think we don't see Joshua Wilder until 2020. I'm hearing that Joshua may actually bounce to HBO, and if that's the case, yeah, it well, makes that fight even harder. If that's the case, I'm not going to be at ringside for the fights. <laughs> unless, <laughs> unless Sky calls me. Calls me. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, you will. You'll still be with Sky. <laughs>